Today's scriptures focus on the disciples' mountaintop experience during the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. That scripture is in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking to Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am so happy to be sharing this worship with 300 of my closest friends. <laughs> A little bit nervous. I was talking to my mom last night. She's like, you got this. Just imagine everybody in their pajamas. I'm like, mom. We've been in our pajamas for weeks now. That doesn't help. Anyway, I know there are people out there who don't know me. So real quickly, I introduce myself. My name is Kelly Mongreen. I'm a lifelong church member, and I've been a minister for about 14 years. And I'm currently co-pastoring at Auburn, Washington. Hi, Auburn. I miss everybody so much. Uh, some of you may recognize me um, as the singer in the Web of Life ministry that I did for 10 years. And um, the kids out there will recognize me as a spec co-leader that I've been doing for the last seven. So I have three grown kids of my own and two grandsons, one of which was just born last week. And he is adorable and perfect, of course. Um, let's see, I've worked for Alaska Airlines for 34 years and I spend my free time hiking and biking and reading and my guilty pleasure of watching reality TV. Anyway, enough about me. I will say I have had a lot of amazing mountaintop experiences in both my personal and my spiritual life. And I bring that up because that is what we're going to focus on today. I love, love the theme for today, God's Beloved. And I can't wait to delve into that and share my testimony on how it ties into the scripture for today about the transfiguration. Can you guys even believe we are at this time in the calendar heading into Lent? The Sunday before Ash Wednesday always celebrates this moment where Jesus' earthly body takes on a heavenly glow. And we are reminded that he is both human and divine. The Gospel of Mark gives us this great gift on this last Sunday before Lent, reminding us who Jesus really is and that God's love illuminates the world through Christ, even in the darkness. Uh, our scripture today was Mark 9, 2 through 9. Um, Jason shared that with us and the puppet show shared that with us. So I won't reread it. Um, but I will share my, my take on it. Now, I'm not a scripture snob like Don, Don Welch. I think that's what he called himself a couple weeks ago. Don, are you here? Is that right? Anyway, I am actually taking the scripture class right now. And it's super interesting and has made me look at scripture in a new way by really taking apart the scripture and also putting myself right into the story. So here's my take on it and my testimony. My first thoughts were wondering what it must have been like for Peter and James and John. Here they've been traveling the country with Jesus. They've watched him teach and they've watched him preach and they've seen him perform miracles and walk on water and calm a storm. And so they're on this big, huge high and they've left their jobs to be part of this amazing movement. In this part of the story, in the other Gospels, you'll recognize this scripture. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. So they're hoping for this change that they've been promised by God, a Messiah, a life of peace. 
But then comes the love. Jesus tells him that he will be suffering and be tortured and die and then resurrect. And Peter just can't believe this. It's like, what's Jesus talking about? What the heck? That's not cool. So that's where we pick up six days later. Jesus takes James and John and Peter up to the mountain with him. As they travel high into the mountain, Jesus is suddenly transformed before their very eyes. First, his clothes become dazzling white, and then Elijah and Moses appear talking with Jesus. And Mark tells us that they were afraid. I don't blame them. I was curious, um, and part of this scripture class is to look things up and to, you know, think about things. So Moses is 1400 BC. Elijah is 900 BC. So they lived 500 years apart, 900 years ago. So basically, as we know, they're spirits or a vision. And I'm wondering to myself, why them? Why together? I'm assuming it's because they're both great prophets and because they had their own mountaintop experiences with God. I'm assuming Peter's super stoked to be seeing two of the greatest prophets ever because it says he wants to build these tents to keep them there. Well, different versions say one, one says dwelling, one says tent, um, tabernacle. I, I guess if you thought about dwellings, it'd be so they could stay there forever. Um, the tabernacle kind of to commemorate the moment. And then all of a sudden, they hear the voice of God. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. Then Moses and Elijah disappear. And although it's super confusing, it's so powerful and so amazing. And we've probably all been at moments in our lives like this. Well, sort of like this. Where the experience we're having is so awesome that your mind almost can't comprehend it. And it's super hard to describe. Well, good thing for these guys because they weren't even allowed to tell anybody. Jesus asked them to wait till after his resurrection before they shared. Well, there's no way they went on with their lives and changed after that. Of course, we know they go on to be great disciples for Jesus. Think for a moment about something that changed you. Think about something you saw on vacation or an amazing musical that you saw or a phenomenal hike or a moment at camp, like Jason said, when you really felt God's present. A book that changed your thinking totally or a conversation with someone that moved you. A couple of months ago, my sister and brother-in-law and I uh, went on a midnight hike. We knew it was going to be a clear sky and a full moon and a low moonrise. We went to this place called High Rock and we hiked up two miles to watch the sunset. And then we waited two hours in the dark and in the cold to watch the moon rise. And as that moon came over the mountain and we saw the sliverest of slivers and then it kept rising and rising, it was so amazing. And one of my fondest memories was when I was at Kim Ta and we climbed up Mount Bromac every year. I'm sure there are others here that remember that. We went up for a worship. That singing on that mountain always felt more amazing. The view is 360 degrees and the spirit, seriously, those were some God moments for sure. When you truly felt God, the love and the grace and the presence, and you never wanted to come off that mountain, just like Peter and James and John, trying to fully communicate those moments to someone is hard. We can't really find the words or the pictures to do it justice to what we just witnessed and felt and thought. And that is what I'd like to challenge you all to think about today. When have you had the chance to maybe see God, feel God? Have you taken the time to listen to God? 
We've all probably witnessed the power of God's love in some way, whether it is that sunset or someone whose kindness lifts, lifts you up, or we catch a glimpse of someone reaching out to another person that needs help or is in pain. But how do we put into words such experiences? How do we share God's love and what he has done for us in our lives? Even when we long to share this great news with others, we sometimes hold back. Maybe we're afraid of what others will think. Maybe we're afraid that we won't tell it right. Maybe we think our stories aren't important enough. Here's what I have to say about that. We are loved and we are enough. The girls just sang these words. You are loved. Nothing's going to change his love. You are wanted, not because you're perfect or because you don't think you deserve it. Don't forget how beautiful he made you and that Jesus chose you. Our stories and our journeys are just as good as the stories of Peter and James and John. And more importantly, we should even share the valleys. Like I said, I have a couple of grandsons, one three-year-old Henry, and when he was a baby, he ate all the beans and the peas and the squash, all the green stuff. But then he met cookies and candy. And guess what? Squash for dinner, not so exciting anymore. And the word later is so hard. He wants dessert now. But if we let the sweet stuff, if we let them eat the sweet stuff, we know they won't be interested in nutrition stuff. Parenting 101. They would never have a healthy diet. A mountaintop experience is like dessert. If that's the extent of our spiritual desire, we will be poorly fed. We have to live in the valleys of our faith too. Our stories should contain those valleys. I've had lots of valleys in my life. I divorced with three little kids and we were poor. I like to say financially lean now. Actually, I'm probably still financially lean. <laughs> um, I had my struggles raising my kids. Um, I had doubts in my faith when things weren't going well. Um, I'll never forget this one time that I needed new tires. And I literally went to the bathroom of Les Schwab and started crying because I couldn't afford them. And I was like, God, where are you? Help me, please. I know this is a basic low, right? I know there are deeper lows. I, I'm not trying to trivialize it. I, um, I'll share this one time when I'll, my car, it feels like it was always the car, you know, um, broke down and it was gonna be $1,000. God sent me this angel that I will never forget. One of my best friends gave me a thousand dollars. Who just gives somebody a thousand dollars? If you can do that, God bless you. I, I will never forget that. Um, it has changed my life and has made me be, feel hopeful that there are angels out there, um, that we have to be willing to work through our emotions and the transformation of our attitudes to appreciate the mountaintops. I mentioned Kim Ta a couple of minutes ago, which was a very long time ago for me. One year we did this musical and Leanne Hansen sang the solo I've never forgotten. And I hope she's on today. It was about the valleys and the mountains. Would you cherish loving arms if you'd never shed a tear? Would you welcome going home? if you'd never been away? Would you treasure guiding hands if you'd never been alone? I don't think so. Would you value having hope if you'd never known despair? Would you treasure being safe if you'd never lost your way? Would you cherish gentle words if you'd never been afraid? I don't think so. If we knew the love that the Lord has shown to man, if we really try to do what the Lord has planned for us, then we'd love each other more. We would find new happiness. Yes, I think so. I really do think so. 
Paul wrote in Romans 12 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind that you may prove what is the will of God. The transfiguration of Jesus can help us with our own personal transformation. God's love is there for us. And what could be more exciting than that? As we travel through Lent, it's my prayer that you share your stories of transfiguration. You share that dazzling light of Christ. You share the times that God got you through those valleys. And it's my prayer that God will open the ears of the world around you to listen because you too are his beloved. Amen.